happen. Yes, it's almost as though they've forgotten that that is an option. They're so used to when things aren't have the have the ball have the ground wash. The other, as you say, a nap comes up when they brush the grass up, and there's still the rest of the water returns even before you get around to putting the ball back to some extent on uh, where it's been brushed from. Paving for a three. And what a blow at the first hole. It's a three, but more important, it wins the hole. And a great start. He and his partner, Tom Lehman, opened with a three this morning. He doesn't even bother, leave someone else to pick the ball up. And great start in the fourth match. So that's why they don't move the golf ball on the green. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific three from Corey Pavin, who's been a stalwart of the American side so far in this 31st Ryder Cup. Pavin out with Lehman this morning, and they managed to beat Montgomery and Faldo. Langer and Johansson one down to them now after one hole. They're quite a long way behind because of the length of time that the forums went on. Couples in love, two up. Maggot and Roberts are one up. Seve and Guilford are back. You may have had some luxury with that putt. As we go back to see David Guilford. We'll go forward to see David Guilford. This is on the seventh. And Seve has missed the green. So it was important for David Guilford to try and get uh, at least centre. He's managed to find the putting surface. Sam Torrens behind. That was for a half. And a bit behind with Lauren Roberts and Jeff Maggot. So they're still two down in that group, Europe. As we go back to the commentary booth and we'll pick up the action again with Bruce Critchley and Ewan Murray. Thanks very much, David. Nice to be in the company of Butch Harmon and Larry Mize and Tim Barter, former Ryder Cup player Paul Broadhurst, Ken Brown, who has played in this wonderful event five times, and one more than that is Peter Oosterhuis. So, some very high-quality chappies out there, and we can hear now from Ken Brown. 155 yards, going there with a seven iron, coming up a little shy. Didn't want to go past the flag, but he wanted to get it onto the putting green. So he's got the advantage of going up the putting surface, unlike David Guilford. I think both Faldo and Montgomery forming a committee to decide on the line of this putt. As I was saying earlier on today, Faldo, as you might expect, has a much more analytical and statistical approach to finding the line on putts. He likes to work back from the hole and see certain points over which the ball must travel to go into the hole. Rocker to win the sixth hole, and another one rather like the fourth just slips past the right edge of the hole. Sam Torrance and Constantino Rocca are one down. Pot of Montgomery at for a four at the at the fifth. There's still Faldo with a putt a similar of similar length to get a four. Couples is out of it. And see the the ball of uh, Davis Love there, just the marker of it anyway, to the left. But there are a couple down, and they may well go three down unless Faldo pops this in. Now, Tim, what's uh, what do you think of this putt? Well, the main part of it is that it's very much uphill, putting from one level up to the back tier. There's quite a lot of discussion going on with the referee. They just squeeze you some water away from Collins' line and Seems to be some sort of dispute about what's going on with the squeegees. Tim, tell me about uh, Davis Love's pitch. Where was he and what sort of shot did he play? He's just missed the green to the right and pitched up to about five feet short. So he's got a five foot of downhill right to left putt, which may be for the win of the hole if Nick can't convert this one successfully for a four. Tim, what's the problem here? I'm having difficulty hearing the referee. Let me just try and get a little bit closer.
The referee is Larry Startzel, who's on the PGA of American National Rules Committee. They're either past presidents or on the Rules Committee, so steeped in the laws of the game. It well, appears that fellow... Yes, I know what's happened. <laughs> I think that uh, Davis Love is going to go ahead because it's couple shot, is that right? Yes, that appears to be the case. Davis looks on. And the raise of the eyebrows there. And of course he's quite entitled to do this. And I think the discussion was that Love could have gone ahead before Montgomery butted. Whatever happens, Davis Love is a putt for a par four. And should he hold that, then Nick Faldo will have to hold from around 20 feet for a half. Yeah. Very good. Excellent four from Davis Love. And I guess, Bruce, in some ways, they could have claimed the hole. Well, yes, I think you've got to state your intent. Uh, of course, um, Couples' ball was marked. I presume it was marked. It hadn't picked it up in total as they're still discussing it a little bit but if he'd actually picked his ball up then of course he doesn't have the right Davis Love does not have the right to putt so um, but I think unless they stated they wanted to to putt I mean obviously Couples was giving no indication of having a go I don't I think it was a sort of late decision oh by the way I think I can have a go at this I think it was a <laughs> bit more done that way <laughs> than uh, any trickiness as Tim said, Faldo up the hill and it's this for a half a good effort from Nick Faldo but they're finding it pretty difficult out there against Couples and Love they've won the last three World Cups in 92 and Lamora Leia at Lake Nona in 93 and at Dorado Beach in Puerto Rico last year you saw that on Sky Sports it doesn't look very good I'm afraid for Faldo and Montgomery. They were on the 6T today, four down. That was earlier this morning. They're now three down in the four balls. Couples and Love in complete control. You're watching the 31st Ryder Cup. It's live on Sky Sports. The Americans have the edge. Welcome back. Live on Sky Sports, the 6th T, the afternoon four balls. That's the tee shot of Davis Love. Ian Couples are three up on Faldo and Montgomery. against such a free-flowing pair you don't want to give them that start because if they get ahead of things and they begin to relax then they can produce to almost magical figures the course drying out all the time so the opportunities for good scores and runs of birdies improving all the time we go ahead to the seventh and Ken's there this for a three or a four Ken this is for a four and a half Sevy's also got a putt for a four but he's a good bit further away and they've spent a long while studying this one. It's up the hill and should break a little from left to right, not much. Oh, that's a terrific putt. That's a really marvellous putt by uh, Guilford. Keeps them all square. Good putt from Guilford at the sixth and seventh. And we go back to the sixth and this the tee shot of Fred Couples. <laughs> well, we've seen how what an awkward pin position this is at six. And uh, years ago, and it was a much nicer day when the helicopter flew over. Quite difficult to get low enough in the helicopter to show you the contours of this hole because of all the trees around. But you can see a very subtly sighted green, not the biggest of targets, a big bunker one side and really water running all around the other two and a half sides. So something's got to happen for this bearing. They lost the last hole to a par, which in a four ball is, uh, well, just not good enough. This was the hole where things got turned around this morning. 
They were four down on this tee and a two here set them on the road to recovery even though they eventually failed at the final hurdle. Beautiful shot. And, uh, it's amazing what sparks a new determination, a little sort of quizzical moment on the last green that might get you a bit angry and a bit fired up and jerk you out of a sort of downhearted lethargy. I'll look up at the skies and the top of the trees to find out which way the wind's coming from. this one a lot better has he got the distance right not quite half a club shot good line but nevertheless foul though closest to the hole at the sixth uh, well, some news coming in and you may have heard Ken Brown deliver some words to you there and we'll be able to catch up exactly what he meant Ken I think we heard some of that Ken do you want to have another crack at it yes I would do and a very interesting thing happened at the last hole the Europeans actually won the hole because Peter Jacobson thought Brad Faxon had got a par when in fact he'd been in the water, taken a penalty drop and taken a five. So Faxon, uh, Jacobson did have a putt to half the hole but picked his ball up and of course the Europeans hold out for a four so they actually won the hole slightly by default. So there's a little twinkle in Seve's eye. Well never mind Ken, we're happy to accept anything that comes our way as we watch the third shot of Costantino Rocca there from the left-hand side. Good shot. Sixth green, the par three. And Colin Montgomery and Nick Fowler are going to work on Nick's birdie putt. They've chosen that Nick should putt first. Colin obviously only just found the front of the green there and has a very tricky putt indeed, so they've decided to uh, take the option of Nick putting first. And he's got an uphill putt that's going to move a little bit from left to right. See whether he can't make his birdie too before the Americans have a chance to putt. Yes, it's a difficult one this time because it's left to right, but if it runs out of pace, it will turn from right to left at the hole. So it requires a lot of studying, and that's exactly what Faldo and Montgomery are doing. Taking plenty of time, fouled up. And he won't get that second turn if he hits this one hard enough. Too hard through the break. Now we've got problems because that one's gone just about as far past and Colin Montgomery hasn't batted. Tim's already said how difficult the putt he's faced with. So it's all good and well doing these things if you're successful. That's right, and uh, I'm reminded of when Faldo and Montgomery were playing Cook and Beck last time in the 18th hole, and I think they, it's an error to do that when, unless you're certain of popping one in, almost certain. This is Sam Torrance. Well, that's one way of stopping the ball. That's his third shot. They recorded that. Now, Rocco for a four. And he gets it, so Sam saved the trouble anyway. Yes, but remember Lauren Roberts in fine shape after a beautiful second shot, so the Americans still in with a chance. Uh, I'm not too sure here, actually. <laughs> I know uh, interviewing Sam this morning was quite nerve-wracking, so uh, no, obviously I'd, I'd like to be playing, but uh, you know I'm enjoying the, the atmosphere greatly. Well, you're doing a fine job out there in extremely trying conditions. It's been raining for the best part of five hours. Thankfully now off, a little bit of breeze getting up, so hopefully that will dry out the greens and we'll see these four balls through to a finish. 7.09 is the sunset. Langer due in somewhere around 7 o'clock. They'll have to step on the gas.
Well, that's uh, a very good three, three excellent shots from Roberts. That's why you see that he's got such a wonderful reputation as a patter. Of course, he was a, a losing, one of the losing playoffists with uh, Colin Montgomery last year at Oakmont in the US Open. Not done a lot since then. Now, back to the sixth green, and there's been a bit of putting going on there. Our Faldo, although he was close to his head first go, what's been happening, Tim? Well, Freddie Couples is about to putt for a birdie two. Monty's putted from the front of the green and come up some six, seven feet short, so he's still got quite a lot of work to do, as is Nick Faldo. Davis Love had a bit of a charge at his birdie putt, and he has one left from about five feet on the other side of the hole. Ewan talked about the cape that sticks out into this uh, sixth green and you go up one side and you end up the greens all the time drying out, getting that little bit quicker. And I'll tell you what, the second hole, this is going to be one with a par. Yes, ideally you want your tee shot to be in the front left quarter of the green so you're putting straight up the hill. And another mistake, you know, you think of Faldo, he would have learnt from Fred Couples but if he'd waited his turn and uh, so the logic of the man closest to the hole going first is very much based on him holding out to give his partner a free one it's not a one of getting your ball in the hole first against them the Americans up in three matches David Guilford and Seve Ballesteros flying the European flag they're one up after seven holes against Brad Faxon and Peter Jacobson Well, Freddie would have played close attention to this one as it went past the hole. Now very much uphill, obviously. It's a good firm round the green still, damp on top. Oh, well, that's the first play of three putt. Well, it may not be the last. So who's next, Tim? Nick Faldo is going to go next, and uh, playing partner Colin Montgomery. He's going to work on this one. Rarely see players of this quality three putting. They're all attacking the hole with such force. And where was Davis Love, did you say? Davis Love's had a bolt at his button. He's got about five feet left on the other side of the hole. Monty has a putt of about six feet from short of the flag, so let's hope Nick can pop this one in and put the pressure on Davis Love to stay three up with a five footer for the half. Well, a comedy of errors but there's not very much that's amusing in it well now is the time for Falder to pop one in and at least give Montgomery a, a certainty that if he misses it doesn't it matter we've already got the four To his tee shot if they lose this hole to a three they really do need to examine the strategy and if you think Faldo's putt was difficult wait till you see this one from Montgomery it's got a vicious swing across the front of the hole from right to left and virtually quarter of the hole in play here because the turn's going to be so severe at the end madness that waited till he put it after couples but won the hole so Davis Love now with a five and a half footer and if he's successful there then that will take the Americans four up after only six holes I guess in some way it's understandable. You're three down, so you try and change things. Jacobson 
getting one a little thin through the green and of course these players are trying to take as little sand as possible if the club digs down into it and it doesn't come out at all a la Langer at the 17th this morning Love must think his birthdays have come at once and he's taking full advantage as well terrific putt from Davis Love but you have to say that was handed to him on a plate and his facial expression tells the whole story. Harlow and Montgomery will be disgusted. They go to the 70, they're four down. Well, we thought we saw plenty this morning. My goodness, what's happening this afternoon? The Americans up in three matches. The only bright spark for the Europeans, David Guilford and Severiano Ballesteros match in which we're ahead and the rest we're suffering we'll stay right to the finish tonight for as long as the golf is going on in the golf course we'll be there Nick Farlow on seven and watching that intently beside me former US Ryder Cup star Larry Mize and Butch Harmon Greg Norman's coach Greg Norman of course can look on and enjoy being a spectator this weekend David Guilford pops one in so that group's going well Thankfully for Europe, that was for a half. <laughs> he's hold a few precious ones for halves today, Larry, David Guilford. Yes, he has. He's made a very good par putt back there on the seventh and another good putt there. Uh, one thing, I think, even though the players didn't look that good on number six, I think that lets us all know how difficult it is out there. The greens, there's a lot of undulation you can't see, and they're very slick. Uh, hit the putt the least bit too hard, you're going to run it four or five feet by. So it's... Uh, tough conditions and a lot of pressure out there. I know you can't believe what happened with Peter Jacobson and Brad Faxon. Yeah, that, that surprises me, the, the miscommunication between the two and one not knowing what the other one's doing. So uh, I don't think it'll happen with them again. Well, there's Seve enjoying that one. He's enjoying being back in the fray, Seve, this afternoon. And uh, I'll be interested to see whether Butch Harmon, you, you'll be watching his swing this afternoon. We all know that he's been having problems. We can maybe have some impressions from you as uh, time goes on. You know, I think this is a good sign for this uh, twosome in this match. David Guilford has carried them uh, all the way through the first nine. Uh, they're one up playing the ninth hole. Uh, Seve's going to get it together here pretty soon. And this could be a tough combo coming down the stretch. I think Brad and Peter have their work cut out for them. If you've come in late, remember, exclusively live in Sky Sports, it was 2-2 in the foursomes this morning after at one stage in the early stages looking really drastic for Europe they got it back then it looked as if we were in good position ended up a draw and I'm sure that if someone offered Donald Gallagher a 2-2 in the afternoon four balls at the moment he would uh, fight their hand off for that at the moment a lot to do in a couple of these matches and sadly for Nick Fowler and Colin Montgomery they are the ones who are suffering most once again so as we move back towards uh, live action with Seve, he's taking some uh, time off from that one after something distracted him. We'll pick up the action again with the descriptive qualities of Bruce Critchley and Ewan Murray. Thank you, David. Just a little bit disturbed there by some movement in the gallery. His driving hasn't been so good, and yes, we'll look forward to the words from Butch Harmon later on. See if he can find the fairway here. Well, the ball, in my opinion, is forward and there's too much of an angle between the top of the club and his left wrist. The club then goes too straight, too long. Then he flips it over and it goes laid off and shut. And when a good player gets shut, he gets underneath it on the way through to try and keep the face square. Have a look at that again. Into the backswing here. At that point, I feel he's a little flat, and you see how the club face is looking straight to the sky. That's in a shut position. Now the head goes back underneath and behind it to try and get the club face looking at the target. Off comes the right hand. Guilford looks like he may have gone down the other side, down the right. And there's not too much future if you miss the fairway right, but that one's probably okay. It's just hang on to the short stuff. So all not lost for our dynamic duo out there, the only match that is up in the four balls. So Fred Cuffles just drifted off the edge of this seventh fairway, has 187 yards to go. And the semi rough with the six iron, the flag today cut very much on the right hand side at the front, so Freddie if he wants to attack that flag has got to come in over the front right bunker. What wind there is is against and from the left.
and that wasn't far from being a very good shot indeed he did what Tim was saying Tim Barter was saying he brought it in from the left but in the process just uh, lost a little bit of height cut it up in the woods in the wind rather Jacobson at the ninth and pitching past David Guilford plays much longer than its 419 yards because it's pitching into the upslope and it's uphill all the way to the green and a green where you can only see the top half of the pin even from the middle of the fairway lovely to see John Jacobs walking up that ninth hole there he was coming back we're at the par 4 seventh the third shot of Nick Faldo he and Montgomery are four down to couples in love glorious shot there from Faldo but uh, at best only a par Montgomery the only one of this four on the green but not that close so that's been conceded and we'll go to the eighth green Sam Torrance uh, Sam's just put in for four actually drove it into the bunker and left it in there but um, he had a tremendous third shot managed to get it there but that's made well, it's just made five what about Rocker, Paul? Well, Rocker's actually drove it in the rough on the right-hand side, could only move it forward 150 yards, and he's just chipped on to about 10 feet. Seventh uh, hole, third shot, Freddie Couples. Putting style, very little wrist, and let the loft of the club lift it onto the front edge. And you see, he just caught the fringe there, took all the sting out of it. And Couples left with a lengthy putt there for a par. What do you think of the four balls so far, Bruce? Well, being a European, it's been a, a disappointing afternoon. It's almost as though the Europeans' minds and hearts were still with Langer and Biosteros as they were finishing off this morning. And when they went out, they were sort of mentally elsewhere, and the Americans took uh, full advantage of it. And I think particularly in that bottom match, you are seeing the result, not quite certain what the scores are, but you're seeing the result of Langer and Johansson literally having to have, you know, put on a dry set of clothes and go straight back out again, whereas Pavin had been in from the top match in the morning and Mickelson's brand new. And I think, uh, as I say, you, you, as I said at the time, uh, Gallagher, given another 15 or 20 minutes to put his pairings in, would not have put them out again, I don't think. Spice playing with Guilford, Langer with Johansson. And speaking to John Jacobs earlier this week, he said that was the hardest thing that he had to do, was to put his four ball pairings out before the foursomes finished. It's the way things are done. And out here at the eighth, Lauren Roberts and Jeff Maggot, who are up against Sam Torrance and Costantino Rocca, have a chance to go three up. Fine pin position here at the eighth. Right up the back right hand corner, the hole playing its full distance. That's a certain four, and even if uh, both the Americans miss, we still have Rocco with a ten-footer to hole, not to go three down by taking five. Robert Simon, really, who's grown in stature since his win at the Bay Hill in the Nestle Invitational. He'd struggled for a few years to make a name for himself as one of the top players, but burst through that week in a very high quality field, and he's gone on from there. Came so close to taking the US Open Championship, of course, at the Oakmont Golf and Country Club in Pennsylvania. Colin Montgomery back on seven. Comes down the hill, it will move from left to right. Oh, not quite quickly enough. And that's a four for Davis Love. So although the two chances that we had of winning the seventh hole have both been taken away. Montgomery didn't hold. Love got down in force. That's a half and still four down after seven. And much harder unless you can find a string of birdies to come back from that sort of thing in four balls. 
I would have to think this match has got a long way to go yet. I get the feeling that Faldo and Montgomery will click before long. And the mistake, well, the mistake I think they made at the sixth will only fire them on to do better things. Let's hope so, because they're certainly up against it at the moment. Four down after seven. And the bottom score you can see there, Europe 2, the United States 2. That was the result of the morning foursomes that were delayed in many ways because Langer and Johansson had so much problem with water in the greens over the last seven holes. They're having a problem in the final match today too against Corey Pavin and Phil Mickelson. Three down after three and because of that delay in the foursomes they were out at least half an hour. I think it was a touch more than that to be perfectly honest. So they're quite a long way behind the third match which is the one we've just seen. Faldo and Monte and Levin Couples. But good news for Europe, David Guilford and Severiano Ballesteros are on the ninth at the moment. They are one up against Brad Faxon and Peter Jacobson. And in the other match, Sam Torrance and Costantino Rocca are now three down against Jeff Maggot and Lauren Roberts. So certainly the Americans looking in total control, but a couple of birdies can change all that, so we mustn't get too downhearted too early. And after all, it is only day one. Tomorrow we've got the fourth. that a bit left and that's short of the bunker and that's a bad tee shot he's been trying to cure that this week he's had a touch of the hit lefts and he's been trying to hit a get a little left to righter going but occasionally hits that one it's quite difficult to get the ball left to right with a short backswing because it doesn't create an awful lot of power and very easy for the right hand to turn into it a fraction earlier we haven't heard from Ken Brown for a few moments what's happening Ken well, it's been a very adventurous hole for most of these players and Seve's been left with this one for a par four and a half. His tee shot went 60 yards and he hit another driver off the deck which took him 220 yards. And an eight iron to here. As I say, this for a four and this for a half. Well... <laughs> And I tell you, it's very difficult to play against that sort of stuff. You get uh, you get quite depressed drivers for your third and gets a four out of it. But you have to worry <laughs> that uh, that's the one match we're ahead in because it looks awfully fragile. But while he's smiling, we've got a chance. Europe's got a chance. He's infectious as well. I've no doubt if they can post a win in the first match, news will filter back and perhaps Faldo and Monte will find something. So will Torrance and Rocca. And Langer and Johansson have got it all to do. Smiles and a word of warning from Ballesteros at the ninth. One up going into the back nine, but it's the only match we're up in. The Americans up in matches two, three and four. The Ryder Cup is live and exclusive. It's here on Sky Sports and it's pretty good stuff. Evening to you over there in the United Kingdom. If you've just joined us, it's day one of the Ryder Cup live here on Sky Sports. 2-2, two, two, the morning foursomes, but it's not such good news in the afternoon. We're down in three matches, but we're up in the first one. And that's where we go now. The 10th tee, Guilford and Ballesteros, one up on Faxon and Jacobson. Well, Seve is yet to hit a fairway, but I think he may well have hit this one just down the left-hand side. It went over the bunker. Guildford certainly in perfect position. So Guildford, definitely the iron man of this team at the moment. Three wood for Faxon. His 10th hole, Cancel Grove, 429 yards downhill and sort of right alongside the, the first hole or in the same direction as the first hole and not a dissimilar sort of hole. Yes, just separated by that mammoth par 5 13th, which seemed to play like half a mile long today. Jacobson down the left with a fade for him. Started a little straight. He does move the ball from left to right, and now there's a tree down there. And it looks very much like he will be behind it. What a year it's been for Peter Jacobson. 
two victories, one at Pebble Beach in the AT&T and then the following week at Torrey Pines in San Diego. And that took him to the top of the money list and he's still up there in the first 10 or so. So Jacobson going to have his best year by far after rededicating himself to this game some two years ago. A man of multi-talents, of course, has his own pop group and that includes Craig Stadler and Payne Stewart and very enjoyable to listen to. Jake Trout and the Flounders, it's called. <laughs> and what do the others play? <laughs> well, there's something fishy about that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> They wander down the 10th. There's the handsome clubhouse sort of peeping out. It really is a, a wonderful setting, very majestic. And reminds me a lot of Interlaken, which is up there in Minneapolis and Paul's, where they played the Walker Cup a couple of years ago. Same sort of age course, very much the same type. Clubhouse actually looks pretty similar. And uh, there are some places, I mean, you think when you come to the United States that you want to go to South Carolina, Florida for your golf. If you can find your way to these parts of the world and and have the odd connection to get you onto these courses. There's some absolute joy. There's about three or four golf courses around here that uh, are of comparable quality, all within about a five-mile place. A bit like sort of Surrey and Berkshire back home. Same age, same type, not heather and pine and the sand belt there, but it's beautiful golf courses, and the crowd's been well rewarded. Well, Savvy Ballesteros managed to make his debut in the four balls Howard Clark and Mark James had a pretty heavy defeat Faldo played twice today, Guilford in this afternoon and Per Ulrich Johansson in his first match managed to record his first point with the man below him there Bernhard Langer. For Monte it's been tough, Torrance and Rocker have been in great form for Philip Walton and Ian Woosnam, well they've yet to make their debut in this 31st Ryder Cup as far as the Americans are concerned, you can see there all the names and they're all going to have had a taste of action in this first day. Phil Mickelson out in the last match with Corey Pavin against Langer and Johansson. Brad Faxon, his first taste alongside Peter Jacobson, who hasn't played in this competition for quite some time. Tim Barter is watching the third shot of Nick Faldo. Nick missing the fairway left off the tee, just coming up short of the left-hand bunker there and got such a poor lie unable to reach the green, so he's laid up to here at 45 yards to go, pinning well towards the back of the green. Monty's hit a nice second shot, about 15 feet short of the flag. The Fred Couple's just on the front right edge of the green, but a putt of some 60 feet. And Davis Love, after a huge drive over 300 yards, just off the back edge in a vicious lie on the Dan slope, just over the green, so he's got very difficult footing for his third shot very nicely played getting that little release up into the almost a sort of conservatory on this green this little little extra piece added on the back now I head to the very top match and by a serious didn't as Ken thought find the fairway hasn't found one today only found two in practice yesterday played a little bit of uh, foursomes in that so he didn't drive at every hole but it's uh, not been a good time on this narrow course now Ken ball sitting up rather nicely 148 yards the ideal angle to get to the flag of course when he lands on the green this is going to release coming out of the rough well, he's given it plenty of air and the greens are white and then he manages to bring it to a standstill and it doesn't seem to matter where his tee shots go he is such a will to win by Asteros and this should be a lesson to the rest of the team I'm sure James and Clark are a little despondent after what has to be said was a poor display this morning and Ian Woosnam yet to go out there and play lost all confidence with his game well he should really be out there having a look at Asteros and watch him get round the course because somehow he'll do it Yes, and when you think how poorly he's hitting the ball and how much trouble he's having hitting it straight, to be still smiling, still enthusiastic, so many players where the head would be down and, well, they wouldn't want to play, but he just wants to play and have a go and he loves, well, he's always been his own style of play and got round with peculiar methods and missing fairways. Now, this is Jacobson across the other side, just playing out. He's got to be careful to avoid the stream in fact he was having a go for the green i thought he was just playing out short of the green because the trees blocked him out but not on the green 
last match and Phil Mickelson and Corey Pavin this at the par 5 fourth and another one in and what a start it's been for Mickelson his first Ryder Cup and enjoying huge success in that final match Langer and Johansson really up against it second match now Rocker That was for a half and not for the first time just slipping past the right edge so Costantino and Sam in a lot of trouble at the ninth hole Rocker a wonderful second shot too well what you saw there 15 feet but Lauren Roberts chipped in for a birdie so the Americans riding high will go forward to the 10th there's Faxon to play ahead of Guildford get out be right and it wasn't he's in there two peas in a pod in the bunker couldn't believe it well, I told you Lauren Roberts chipped in at the 9th it's a very unlikely place to do it from one foot in the bunker, right hand on the steel of the shaft, didn't make any difference, beautiful shot and I'm afraid another arrow in the heart there for Sam Torrance and Costantino Rocca because they're in the same position as Faldo and Montgomery the Europeans are four down Good news is in this group. His partner already in with a uh, there with a putt for a three. So both of them have got a chance at a three. Both of the oppositions are in the bunker, and uh, they're one up, and with every chance of going two up. And with that putt at the fourth, America four up in the next three matches. Montgomery for his birdie at the eighth. Nick Faldo's gone ahead and putted out and made four, so it's a putt for a, a three. Doesn't need to worry about the result. <laughs> Turned just a little too late in that one, Tim. Finished behind the hole. And His Royal Highness, the Duke of York, Prince Andrew, a very keen golfer himself, and plays a bit of golf at the Swinley Forest Club, one of the exclusive clubs in the areas Bruce was talking about. And coached by Doug McClelland who won the Dutch Open Championship back in 1973 and a very very fine player we'll be seeing a lot more of him in the next few years in pro-ams and that will be great for the game charming man too interested onlooker as there are so many European supporters here but and as they had all the excitement this morning when it looked like we were going to maybe take the lead 3-1 but Faldo and Montgomery fell at the final hurdle to Corey Pavin and Tim Lemon and Tom Lemon rather it's Tim we can talk to now so this for Davis not to halve this 8th hole in par 4 fairly straight 6 foot <laughs> Bruce I have to say he is a very different player alongside couples Yes, he is. It's uh, it's extraordinary because we've seen, we've been watching all year, some tiny putts missed and self-doubt, but having couples alongside him, he feels he's got the support he needs, and he's, of course, has some uh, great length and a good touch around the greens a lot of the time. And, of course, the Americans, when you're four up, you get the six-footers in. It's when you've got them for halves and you're four down, you don't. Half past eight, it is at home. Four up seems to be the popular score. Well into the afternoon four ball matches now and David Guilford and Savvy Ballesteros are leading the way one up on Brad Faxon and Peter Jacobson. This for three. You can see the marker of uh, either Faxon or Jacobson up there. He's popped another one in. Oh! Amazing how that happens and other sides up those were the ones that go in so that's a, a four Americans both in the bunker remember in two and still Seve to play
Seve's got a little putt down the hill as well. This is an absolutely vital match for Europe. They're down in the other three, and they don't want to finish this series 4-0 down. Over the years, if you ever lose a series by 4-0, it's very almost, well, in fact, it's almost impossible to come back. So this match for Europe is absolutely vital. Difficult player to play against by Stavis. Uh, studio against Larry Mize and Hal Sutton played against by Stavis and Olaf Fabel back in 87. How difficult was it, Larry? Well, it's extremely difficult. You, you just never know with Seve. He may miss the fairway, he may miss the green, but he can chip it in. He can he can come at you from out of nowhere. I remember we, we had him down most of the day, but we never could put him away. Seve chipped in for par on 16, made a long birdie putt on 15, and uh, it wasn't until finally on 17 we were able to win the match, but Hal played extremely well, and I was able to help him some. He's, uh, Seve's just extremely tough, and of course, Jose was with him then too. Extremely tough, and that's just how tough you are. <laughs> I mean, you know, the man, by all intents and purposes, cannot play. And look at him, birdies, putts going in, and he's loving it. Yes, but you all said that Ballesteros wouldn't play, and I said he's an inspirational player, and somehow he can find the putts and the shots when he needs them, and he's really looking after David Guilford extremely well out there, because Guilford's playing his normal steady game, Ballesteros is just running right when it comes on the green, and when he has to knock in a putt, he's managed to do it. The two up, they are indeed, and it's uh, quite extraordinary. This is the hole they're now about to play, 192 yards, a little bit downhill left to right, waterfall because there is a, almost like a dam at that point on the course and the water keeps the flow going of Allen's Creek. And the green sits a little bit at you again, another rather like at the eighth. There's another of those little sort of almost afterthought pieces of green up the back left-hand side. And maybe the pin will be there either tomorrow or on Sunday. Here's a, see it shows you how much it drops from tea to green. Down it goes and comes to the stream and then up again the other side and the green looking just a little at you bunkers all round once again though keep your ball below the level of the tee below the level of the pin it's playing a, a three or a four iron five iron maybe for some and that's the ideal shot stop it there and then have a putt for a two and for Seve Ballesteros at least it's uh, once he gets an iron in his hand he's a totally different player than he is with a driver I see Pompey written on the Union Jack there, and that's down in Portsmouth. Portsmouth FC's football team's nickname, Terry Fennick, the former Spurs player, now the manager down there. And always been a good side too, Portsmouth, a good side to watch. Some good golf courses down in that department, and so many of the European spectators are from all parts going around the course yesterday there was an awful lot of Italians out there and a few Spaniards as well hoping to support Ballesteros. Ken, how far? What club? 196 yards going with a four iron. Difficult to get close to this pin. The wind coming off the left and the pin tucked in the left corner. That looks pretty good for the centre of the green. Centre short, and the long, long putt. And pin is up towards that back left-hand side. So, Ken, just how long is this hole playing this afternoon? Do you reckon? It's uh, 196, but the interesting thing, it's uh, 182 to clear the bunker that cuts in on the on the left-hand side of the putting surface. So the players are trying to take that out of play. As I say, the wind coming in off the left with a pin on the left, very difficult to get the ball close because you just try and work the ball in with a draw, a right to left spin, and it's very easy to overcook it and pitch it in one of those bunkers. And anything stick high, about 20 feet right, is an excellent shot. At it, two up and seven to play, two up and eight to play, and he's done exactly what Ken was talking about. Just tugged it a fraction left, and very awkward little chip back, as we've seen. Once you miss these greens close by and go in the thick stuff, almost impossible to get close. Clever shot there from Gilbert, though, going for the flag by Stana safely on the green, and not so sure how far left it was, but it was quite near the target and half a club too much. And I think the club he had in his hand to start with would have 
put the ball in the same area as Ballesteros. Faxon and Jacobson must wonder quite how it is they're down. Very difficult also to play against the sort of golf that that Biasteras plays. You know you can't sort of feed off a good rhythm and uh, hitting the middle of greens and close putting. It's very disconcerting. And failing to find the green there. After a nice long tee shot, Colin Montgomery's second shot to the ninth. 157 yards to go and the flag cut front left. Behind the bunker, Colin, no view of the green at all, just drawing that one into the pin. A very nice shot indeed, he couldn't see where he was going. And threes and twos have got to start coming from this group, as they have in this one. Very fine second shot from Costantino in between the bunker and the flag. The tenth hole, as I say, not dissimilar in many ways from the first 429 yards. The first is across over to the right hand side. Just the solitary bunker down the left hand side, which the players can get beyond. Ideally, on most days, you want to be over on the right to get the best view of the green, but with the pin, cut as it is today just over that front right hand bunker you really want to get as close to the bunker on the left hand side of the fairway to get at this pin Rockham Torrance look on this maggots but just drifts off to the right so maybe a a glimmer of hope here for the Europeans. It was a lovely shot from Rocker, that. And we saw today that even matches that were four and five up, once you lost a couple of holes, there was an element of doubt went into the player's mind. And the same can happen here, but it has to happen quickly. matches two three and four where we're down no time has the European side won a hole in any of them and in the top match start winning holes that of course happened when Jacobson picked up his ball by mistake on the seventh and that gave a little bit of inspiration or a little glimmer of hope that Seve needed in a way he and Guilford have gone they're only two up back of the 10th green dead though but that was a free one his partner having got the four so a chance for Torrance and Rocker to win their first hole of the day or their first hole in this match chance for Bernhard Langer to win the fifth and he does it too they're back to three down if you just come in, you're wondering why this match is so far behind. Well, Langer and Johansson will involved in a titanic battle this morning with Corey Pavin and Tom Lehman. So, a win at the fifth, 
and no holes half so far in that last match. Four down, Faldo and Montgomery, four. Torrance on the 10th, off tape. So close, but when you're four down, as Sam Torrance and Constantina Rocca are against Jeff Maggot and Lauren Roberts, things tend to go against you. So they remain four down and they'll need some miracles in the back nine after their good performance this morning to keep their good record going in this 1995 Ryder Cup. In the meantime, it's back with the top match, Seve Ballesteros, who, as Ewan has said, uh, has emerged as an inspirational player. Let's go to the 11th. It's along that hill, Pat, this for a two. Come up a little bit shy, but a three could be good enough. Jacobson is at the back of the green for two, and Brad Faxon is still some 20 yards away in the deep rough, so he'll have a devil's own job to get down in two from where he is. Now the three players here have all made their par fours. So Colin Montgomery with an 18-footer. It's going to move a little bit from left to right for a birdie three and a win. much going right at all for our top pair. And it's going to be a day they'll remember for quite some time. And if things don't change very quickly, it's going to be two defeats inside eight hours. This is the shot for Faxon that Ken Brown was talking about. Always you've got to play a sort of short bunker shot. We saw couples trying to got it to stop quickly enough, but uh, so difficult to get any judgment of distance from there. So, Europe already has a three, courtesy of Ballesteros, and either Jacobson or Faxon have got a hole there, Pat. That's another look at his second shot. It's a full-blown bunker shot. Wet grass. Played it pretty well. in a state of shock as I say it was that uh, they were cruising along they were one up after six holes after five holes and then at the sixth they lost that and then the seventh they lost another when Jacobson picked his ball up believing Faxon had got a four and in fact he'd had a drop out of the water now Ken Brown that looks of Jacobson's but looks like he's right up against the collar of rough Yes, it's a difficult one. He's just about an inch or so away from it. So he can just about get the club onto the back of the wall. Down the hill very fast. This for a three and a half. This time he turns the tables on Ballesteros. What a terrific three from Peter Jacobson. And that will do a lot for their morale huge amount of noise out there it's an almost uncanny feeling being here at the Ryder Cup those of you who have been over to the Belfry will know the volume of noise but when you've got trees around you it tends to echo and it's three times louder than it really is so it's Europe there one up but in actual fact they're two up because that was for a three for Peter Jacobson So two up and seven holes left to play. David Guilford and Ballesteros, but I'm afraid there's no good news to report in the last three matches. Never mind, it's been an excellent day's golf so far, and of course we'll be with it right the way through to the end of the four balls today, and then of course it's more of the same tomorrow. Four up, Maggot and Roberts. Four up, Fred Couples and Davis Love. And with that birdie at the fifth, Bernhard Langer and Per Ulrich Johansson have pegged the gap back to just three holes. Confirmation two up there, Guilford and Ballesteros. Twelfth hole, the shortish par four up the hill. Many of the players playing a, a one iron or a three wood off the tee. And for Ballesteros, he's decided on the iron. You get the feeling because he's two up, Bruce, that confidence is coming back and the swing is getting just a little better. Yes, and I think he's much happier with an iron club in his hand he seems to stand up to it better swing better 
and hit it straighter. And I think it's a touch left, more than a touch left. So once more he'll look to David Guilford. So we go back to Fred Keppel's his tee shot off the ten. at the 10th hole from the camera position behind the green on the right and zooming back towards the bunker you see in the middle of your screen that's a, a lone bunker that is just about pitching distance but one or two of the players getting past that today this is Roberts in the second match still four up oh and when you're four up that's or four down that's the last thing you want to see a certain two that will almost most likely to be conceded and no joy there for Torrance at 12 Faxon shot back very nice rhythm to swim I enjoyed And you would enjoy his company too, Bruce. He's an absolute gentleman, a wonderful dinner companion. Tells some great stories as well. Very well-educated chap and a, a very fine player, as you've seen today. Jacobson also with the Arden at the 12th. Fire Stennis we saw going off into the trees in the left. Peter Wilson was earlier, but that's not the place to be at 12. There's no way of getting the green. So three balls in the fairway and Savvy off to the right of your screen there. But you never know. He has a touch of the Houdinis about him this afternoon by Stelos and there may be more to come. Giant scoreboards you can see around every green informing the spectators of the ever-changing fortunes of both sides. And a very pleasant afternoon now. Still no sun, but reasonable temperatures just around the 60 mark certainly a lot higher than what was predicted to the 11th Sam Torrance uh, he or Rocker have got to get down in two for a half take that away away they were a very good foursomes combination this morning another look at this 11th hole as it settles wanders down to the stream and then rises up the other side and as we've seen this afternoon, they have tucked the pin up beyond, above that second bunker on the left-hand side. 192 yards and a green that has two or three different levels. And, and that was why it was such a good putt by Bayer Steerers from sort of near the front edge to get it up stone dead from down below. The waterfall, all the holes named here. I love the opening, the challenge and then the breather. There isn't a breather on this course. It's all hard, all 18 <laughs> holes of it. There is, the 19th is quite a, an easy hole here. <laughs> as long as you've got enough money to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're having a laugh, but certainly no smile on the face of Fire Steros after that full tee shot. We've got Ken Brown out there on the course. We've got Tim Barton, Peter Oosterhuis, and Paul Broadhouse. Remember, he played in the Ryder Cup side back in 1991 at Kiowa Island. Butch Harmon and Larry Mize with David Livingston in the studio and Bruce Critchley sitting alongside myself. Ken, you can't see the wood for the trees there, I suspect. If Seve can get this one on the green, well, that is just a plain forward miracle. He's got all sorts of trees between him and I've also got a bad light. A lot of professional golfers out watching. Two lady golfers, Dotty Mockery, Amy Allcock are out watching this match. Kenny Venturi was out here earlier on, so a lot of interest from yeah. lady pros and ex-senior golfers. First to play on this hole with Peter Jacobson in the ideal spot, 170 yards. The pin cut back on that left-hand corner, a little bit of wind blowing up, helping the players off the right very little narrow bit of green up there so you've got to be absolutely precise with your iron shot and it's really right between a big seven iron or an easy six what's he going to do with it Ken will he have a crack at the green a little right to left and try and chase it up the bank somehow or maybe into a greenside bunker 
I think he's probably going to try and... Oh, we're talking about Seve, of course, now. The first to play will be Jacobson, but Seve, well, if he can get it anywhere near the green, he'll have an absolute... Well, there's no way he's got no chance whatsoever. But he'll be trying to work out... When he's walking up the fair, he said to me, how's it, how's it, how's it lying? He was desperate for it to be lying well. Finn, as you've seen, is right up the back. And a pretty good shot there. He'll be, be a little disappointed when he gets up because the green feeds down from right to left. And if that had stayed on the putting surface, that might have moved round and ended up really quite close. But that was a big, big putty hole. Three down then would, I think, have been uh, almost sayonara. Six, seven to play. Now, here we go. Is there a biasterous hole that no one else can see? <laughs> no. Nope. That's the problem when you deal off the club, trying to move that end from right to left with white grass, it shuts it even more and you're not able to get any flight. And he wasn't helped there by the green being above him. It's elevated from where they're playing the second shot. But David Guilford's in fine shape and Seve straight out onto the fairway and give him the full advice there. It's wonderful to watch this. It's, you can see how successful Biasteros and Olathaval have been. Back to the tenth. And problems for Faldo. Remember you saw him tug his tee shot at eight. He's tugged another one at ten. So beginning not to play very well. Deep in consultation in the middle there. David Guilford saying what he thinks. And then the caddy of David, Tim Lease, will be having a chat. Seve pointing out all the pitfalls, perhaps the wind coming from that side. And he'll know exactly where he wants to head it on the green. So even though Biasteros has got his own problems at this hole, he's gone straight over there to give Guilford as much encouragement as he possibly can. It's a joy to watch. See, that's the result of it because it installs confidence in your partner that and Guilford will be really enjoying his wander around Oak Hill this afternoon more than Monty and Faldo will absolutely and Montgomery another good golf shot but he's a little bit on his own at the moment and uh, against De Love and Couples you can't play their better ball and it's been a Disappointing day, but we'll go ahead. Faxon now. Hundred and fifty-nine yards. Seven on. Looked at just a just a foot off the green and buried and difficult to find that one. Difficult to say how things are going out there. It's certainly good for Biasteros and Guilford, but you have to think that Torrance and Rocker are up against it. Faldo and Montgomery can't make a dent in love and couples. Bernard Langer and they're up against it. Third shot from Biasteros, and just because his partner's pretty close, doesn't mean he doesn't think he's still got a part to play. Here he comes. And it will pop up. He'll hold that and leave his partner a putt for a three to win the hole. That's the way he's thinking. <laughs> now at last you're coming round to my way of thinking as well. <laughs> uh, it's wonderful to watch. Now the 12th, Brad Faxon from just off the edge. Again playing a similar shot to the one he played at 11. And a little more accurate this time. That was for a four for Faldo at the tenth. Remember, he was uh, in the trees, but only chip out. And that, that usually goes when he holds putts for birdies, but none of those. And well, they were 37 to the turn, better ball, which is two over par. And at uh, this level, and on a better day and a better afternoon than it was a morning, that is not good enough. But Faldo's got his. Now that was correct four ball play. He's gone and got his four, and this for a three for Montgomery. 
He's got the legs. No. So still, they will remain four down. And only eight to play. So a pair of fours for the Europeans at ten. No dent in Cavils and Love over on the 12th Savvy Ballesteros deciding to go first and you see how he's now beginning to involve Guilford in his game that will make him feel a whole lot better it's all part of Savvy's psychology but I'll tell you it does work and the scoreboard doesn't make good reading we can update the Torrance Rocket uh, five down to Maggot and Roberts and Oh, you almost feel you can give Seve this one. Yeah. <laughs> it is quite extraordinary. Yeah, and that is a very important thing to, be, to do. It certainly helps your partner. It irritates the opposition. But, and uh, Guilford now pops his in. It was a, he's not quite on the line that Guilford was on. They've got a half, although I think I say they've got a half. I still think it's uh, Jacobson's putt has got a putt for a three from over on the right hand side. This is really an intriguing tussle. See these two fellas working together. Seve is yet to hit a fairway. What a par that was. Now, can Guildford put in a real killer blow and pick this hole up as well? Has Jacobson had a putt yet, uh, Ken? Yes, Jacobson's had a go. He had a bit of a stab with the chip, and he's some six feet away, so four could yet win the hole. Faxon's about four feet away. But if Guildford pops this in, it's a definite winner. And it's Steel in the eyes of Ballesteros. Guildford for a three. Keep your head up. Well, he had a good crash at it. He got the line OK. And it was the speed that beat him, but as Ken says, it could still be a win. And Ballesteros is just loving this. I was going to say, can you imagine the fate of Guilford had he left that short? <laughs> Third left, and the 13th faces them, a hole that's two yards under 600. And it's uphill, and it's very wet, and will play something in the region of a drive, a two-iron, and a seven-iron. This is the last match, Paven and Mickelson against Langer and Johansson. Second to seven. Finding the green safely. Long downhill left to right. Pat left for Corey Paven. There's still some water lying around on the fairways. But in general, the course has coped extremely well with the downpour we had, which lasted the best part of five hours. haven't given this match up yet either no and even though uh, they're liable to run out of time I think probably Bernhard Langer is dictating the pace here he is a very very deliberate player a lot of players will say gosh we better make up the time as we've been given a, a chance we've only got three hours before dusk or sunset we're not going to see the sunset with the clouds overhead. Good up, Good up. Yeah. And the great thing about that shot is the uphill putt. But three down after six holes. They lost the first four, then won the fifth second match has reached the 12th and this is the approach shot of Lauren Roberts good tee shot but a little up the left may have to move this one a fraction from right to left in the air not sure he had enough swing to get any turn on that ball and it's gone straight at it no chance of coming back onto the green and an extremely difficult third shot left there for Roberts playing with Jeff Maggot and five up on Torrance and Rocker. Absolutely vital to hit this 13th fairway. We saw this morning one or two pairings failing to hit the grip fairway and as Faxon has done there, 
because in fact if you don't hit the fairway you're very pushed to get up in three you was saying 598 yards just two yards under 600 and it requires two good woods and then something from 100 yards or more out and if they miss the fairway either with the tee shot or the second shot five was good enough for the opposition to win the hole Savi Ballesteros just a few moments ago once again the iron and this time starting it off down the left let's hope it's got no draw on it and even with the iron Savi can't find the middle of the fairway all depends how that one's lying now let's have a look at it it's a few hours since we did 598 yards par 5 and the claim of the club it has never been reached in two 300 yards to get to Allen's Creek but that's the bit that crosses the fairway and you can easily find it if you cut your tee shot off to the right hand side having found the fairway then you take a club to lay up because the further you hit the ball the narrower the collar gets and uh, of course those bunkers come into play So that's the 13th and that's where the first match is but we can go back to the seventh hole and pick up the final match the third shot of Per Ulrich Johansson face laid back and very weak good looking shot needed to carry it another yard or so and then he would have got a straight bounce but keen perhaps to leave himself an uphill putt but Langer's on the green in two so no real problem also before Faxon drove this was Guildford he has to follow Seve every time That's on. That's very good shape. Long putt of Corey Pavin. The seventh. Having a good study at this one, and quite understandably so. It's downhill left to right. The green's certainly drying out by the minute. Cut twice this morning. They'll be cut twice again this evening and again tomorrow morning so if there's no further rain you can expect much quicker greens on day two and much more excitement I think as well it was a cracking morning in the foursomes could have gone either way 3-1 to America or 3-1 to Europe it ended up at 2-2 largely because of this man's performance a terrific third shot to the 16th and then a majestic four at the 18th which was good enough to take out Faldo and Montgomery now just watch this turn from here and the last thing you want to leave yourself a downhill cross hill putt for the second and I think Pavin may very well putt out if it's Mickelson next again to get the four but it may well be Langer first Hey, uh, Mickelson with a little chip up from the front of the green. Sevy so just eyeing up his second shot to the 13th. He's found a good light. He's got a few branches to keep the ball under. Going with a three iron. Drifting a little bit down the right hand side. Is it going to stay on the fairway? Just does. So he's still in the hole. <laughs> Mickelson at the seventh, that was for a three. And I don't think that'll be conceded. So they're struggling, but and Langer has a putt for a three. And that uh, that bottom match is far from over yet. Jeff Maggot at the twelfth for a three. running out of steam at the end so the second of Lauren Roberts finishing the bank at the right so no, no need for him to continue that's a four for the Americans back to 13 
Good twin. second of 13, and I think these players are out watching this morning or watching the uh, the television have learnt the, the, how vital it is to keep the ball on the fairway at 13 if you want to make a four, five, let alone a four. Miss Sam Tonks on the back of the 12th green had a few problems up this hole. Sam is in the bunker for two and has got a, a little pitch down the hill, needs this to, to hard the hole. Gets away from Sam. And Rock has got a 10 foot putt now. Keep going. Hole behind at the 11th hole is for a two for Davis Love but again slightly less hard would have dropped in and we had Paul the 10 footer for Rocker it's for a half on the 12th and that one slips by and Torrance and Rocker six down and six to play Sad picture. American Stormy Six. And our hopes are certainly pinned on match one. Severiano Ballesteros and David Guilford giving us a huge amount of thrills. Two up on Faxon and Jacobson. Bad news in the last three matches. However, we could come back. We will. Welcome back to Oak Hill. We're staying right to the end of the live action, or whenever that is. Of course, the final group was held up this morning, and they could be late. We'll stay there. And in the studio with me, Larry Mize and Butch Harmon, uh, giving us the American perspective and things. And I know both of you are uh, enjoying the entertainment from Seve and the, the great play of David Guilford. But what about the rest of it, Larry, and how things are developing? Do you think it's a, an easy 3-1 victory this afternoon for the Americans? Well, I think matches uh, two and three look awfully good. Uh, match four, still a lot of golf left. We're three up, and you've got Bernhard, who's you know one of the best players in the world. So it's looking like we've got two. I'm not saying we've got three yet. And uh, the first match still has a ways to go. They need to change the momentum, but, but Seve really is amazing, isn't he? He is, and, and so is his partner, this man here, David Guilford. Uh, you're right. David's played excellent. Uh, I think it was a, a good call by Gallagher to put these two together, and it's just been, it's been a great team. And almost perfect there. And Butch Harmon watching the variety of swings uh, as coach to Greg Norman and to other players. You're enjoying this. Uh, you're enjoying watching Seve because he's amazing. You. I think Seve is amazing. Number one, he's a fantastic competitor. He has already proven today you can never count him out of a hole. We saw him back on the 12th hole. So far in the trees, we couldn't see him. He came out way short of the green in the high rough. Pitched it on the green, hold a 15-footer for a par to let David Guilford have a chance at a birdie. I think the thing about Seve Ballesteros is, is he's never going to quit, no matter how bad he's playing, he's going to hang in there. He appears to be having a real tough time with the rhythm in his swing, as well as his mechanics. But they're two up, and I think this is very important for Europe to win this match. This is Brad Faxon, one of the rookies on the American team. He qualified with an amazing putt at the US PGA Championship. He certainly got hold of that one. Shot, like. That's a very good shot there, and uh, they need something to get going. They've been a little flat today, and uh, they need to make a couple of birdies here and uh, try and uh, take some momentum away. So that's on this uh, very enjoyable 13th hole, where there's all kinds of problems arising for the players in these conditions. But this is in the 12th tee, and this is Fred Couples. This is uh, a birdie hole in normal conditions, but who knows today, as we go back to the commentary team, a reminder that we'll be here until it gets dark. So with that, here's Bruce and you. And we'll be back when it's dark tomorrow. Then extensive coverage on Sky Sports. One question I have for Larry Mice. I thought he was out on the golf course this afternoon. How come he's in the studio with you again and Paul Broadmaster's wet out there on the course? Well, you know, I'm not sure what happened. It, uh, it was raining and... Uh, 
Paul was doing such a great job out there. We just wanted to keep him out there. And uh, I tell you, Paul, Let hang in there. Larry. <laughs> you, Paul, you're sounding great out there, man. I'm taking, I'm taking notes in here. <laughs> I told you, Bruce, Masters champion, you can do what you want. You can indeed at this game. You can call the shots. And... Now, come on, Faldo. It's been a lackluster day. Lackluster afternoon. And the problem of his pairing with Montgomery, they haven't had a birdie between them in the first 11 holes. It's become very like some Faldo rounds in major championships. Can he perform another miracle, this fellow? His third shot up the bank, had a good kick down to get here. But again, I would say the odds of him getting down into a, at least 10 to 1. Very little green to work with, and it's all very much from right to left. A fourth shot, of course. Standing a long way below his feet. Difficult one. Sevy, only too aware how important this match is. So nearly perfect. Took a chance on landing that one right on the fringe to get it as near as possible, but he'll still be trying to make a five, no doubt. But Brad Faxon ominously close, although he does have a difficult downhill putt with some swing on it. Now just checking to see whose shot it is. Back to the 12th tee, and astonished by that Chris you've been keeping your eyes on the figures and no birdies that's hard to believe it is once again you were thinking, you were thinking how well both these players were playing Faldo and Montgomery they looked in a different class almost to everyone else but it's amazing what happened they ran into a couple of early birdies they got behind both morning and afternoon and to come back twice is asking a tremendous amount it begins to become very wearing on the system when you're always fighting back Uphill and a big swinger for Jacobson. This for his birdie four. Well, he hold one not dissimilar to this on the 11th. You may be wondering why he left the flag in. The fringe looks very much the same colour as the green there, but he was off the padding surface. And looks very much like it's all going to be down to David Guilford and Brad Faxon. Savvy next to play, somehow trying to scramble a five. He might just do it too. It's wonderful to watch, it really is. Half the size of a line. And somewhere in the last two or three holes he'll pull out a spectacular shot and that will be the end of the match. And one thinks that uh, the way he's performing and the, all the things he's doing this afternoon very much a reaction to being left out of the foursomes. All rational thought and the way he's been playing. There was no way you could play him in the foursomes because one player can destroy a foursomes partnership. But uh, he somehow felt he should be there and back he's come. Still looking to play a big part and he is this afternoon. So important what they're doing. Ken Brown was saying you can't afford to lose all four matches, never. Orchestrating the whole show for David Guilford. And he'll welcome that because it will take the pressure off him. 22 of the 24 players have already teed up in this Ryder Cup. Two left to Philip Walton and Ian Woosnam. And one would think that their chance will come perhaps tomorrow morning. And it's been a long day for some of the players out there. It'll be very interesting to see what happens to Nick Faldo and Colin Montgomery. Uh, Gallagher has a, a lot of thinking to do. Very difficult putt to judge this one. It's got a huge swing on it from right to left. I would say probably nearly six or seven feet. And coming out of this first cut of semi, always difficult to judge the pace of it. The ball comes and pops out very quickly and 
runs past the hole. You can see that he's almost aiming away from the hole. And using a putter, Gilbert, because he's not the greatest of chippers. <laughs> How could you let the old boy down? That's fantastic, you know. I was beginning to wonder whether he might have been becoming a little too intrusive and too sort of taking over Guilford's yeah, Not a bit of it. No, Guilford's so quiet and he will have welcomed all the information and all the enthusiasm that Seve has pumped into that twosome this afternoon. Faxon with his work cut out to knock it in for a half. This is couples at 12. Oh, a splendid iron shot, half a club short, but you can see the flag there right up the back edge and no real room between the pin and the fringe. Just as difficult to hold this when the pin's on the front. And we can slip back to 13 and see if Brad Faxon can manage to knock his butt in at 13. There's the reaction from David Guilford. And Faxon with a half, and that's wonderful. That's what the Ryder Cup's all about. It's not about the hype and the pressure we've had over the last seven months. It's about that picture there. So true, so true. And the loneliness of... Well, I was going to say the long-distance runner, but the loneliness of this for the half. And I can't tell you how difficult those putts are when you thought you're bound to have it for a win three up five to play and it's done it's an act of golfing levitation then i think <laughs> i told you it was the sky sports wordsmith Seve's the star of the show this afternoon he and david guilford three up and five to play and you can bet your bottom dollar that he'll produce the winning shot even if it's played by guilford <laughs> We're down in the other three in Great Britain as we go through this live coverage of the four balls in the afternoon, the first day of the 31st Ryder Cup by Johnny Walker. We go down to the 12th, Nick Faldo and Colin Montgomery playing against Couples in Love. Tim Barter can bring us up to date with what's been happening. Well, all four players have found the green here at the shortest par for 12th. Freddie Couples to punt first. He's putting from the lower level, the pin today up on the back left plateau. It's got a part of about 25 feet up the hill. The hill will throw it just a little bit from left to right to start with, and it carries on fairly straight after that. Colin Montgomery's had a beautiful second shot in close to the flag. Bernard Gallagher out here this afternoon watching this match. Just keep an eye on the fortunes of Faldo and Montgomery. Strange, strangely inaccurate putt. Bernard Gallagher watching this match. Leslie Gallagher there in the crowd. Some Jamie Gallagher's here as well. We're down here on the 13th screen. Uh, it's looking very bad for the European team at the moment. Uh, Rock is about 30 feet left of the flag. Some short and three. Rock is by three and maggots. About 10 feet short, looking like two puts for the match. And neither of these two matches, neither of these two matches have the Europeans won a hole. Back to the hole, green before. And two or three of these have got to go in, in quick succession. lost belief on the greens that he can actually find the right line it must be said this is this day is becoming very similar to the opening day in Kiowa Island four years ago when the great pairing then of Faldo and Woosnam just lost in the morning and then went to defeat in the afternoon hopefully Montgomery can lift things or help them change that pattern 
but nothing can help Torrenson Rocker, I suspect, at 13. Is it the fact that they've played poorly, Paul, or have the Americans thrown some wonderful scores at them? Well, well, the, the Europeans haven't played anywhere near as well as they did this morning. Uh, you know, they've missed one or two fairways, and, but the American boys have been very, very straight off the tee. Lauren Roberts especially has played tremendous golf and just made it very, very difficult for the Europeans. You know, put them under a lot of pressure and they've just struggled a little bit this afternoon. Best that will be a five. Magus and yes, you were saying, uh, Paul. Rocker oh. now has got about a 30 foot put across the green. Very difficult put, really, to save the match. It's a 30 foot put left to right. And with the clubhouse just on the screen, the incentive to go off out into the country again, knowing you've got to win every single hole isn't uh, enormous and well Torrance marks that and I think even if Rocker misses this they'll still see one putt from Maggot Torrance was out without his putter in hand and Langer on the hip clattering into the flag wet soggy lie couldn't get the club under the ball and the end is nigh I think in the second match He had the lane okay, but was lost for pace, and one has to think that will be it. Jeff Maggot and Lauren Roberts will put a point on the board. Well, they are asking them to put at that four and a half foot of given there for Rocker. Sam Gloveoff, and he thinks that's the end of the action as far as he's concerned. Two putts for the Americans to win the first point this afternoon. Just a little nudge up to the whole side, that's all that's required. And it's time for shaking hands, the ball's picked up, it's conceded, the match is conceded. And that means that Jeff Maggot and Lauren Roberts take the United States into a 3-2 lead victory over Torrance and Rocker. They played a wonderful part in the foursomes, but it's congratulations from the USA captain Lanny Watkins. And I'm sure he's pretty delighted at the way things have gone this afternoon here at Oak Hill. Six and five victory for Maggot and Roberts against Thompson Rocker and confirmation Europe two, the United States three. Three matches left out in the course. We are up in one, three up in five to go. And Monty and Faldo struggling as is Langer and Johansson. This is Montgomery for a three to win the hole at the 12th. And finally, they get a birdie. Finally they win a hole, and now it's back to three. And just something like that, it's amazing how they can turn and uh, gets another one at the next, and who knows what can happen, but it's uh, an uphill struggle in the bottom three games. A five for Jeff Maggot was good enough to win the 13th, so the margin is seven and five. Three up now, Faldo and Montgomery, but still six holes to play, and if they can get another one back at 13, it will certainly give the Americans something to think about. Haven and Mickelson still in control in the final match. They're on the eighth green at the moment, three up on Bernhard Langer and Per Ulrich Johansson. David Guilford and Seve Ballesteros going away from the clubhouse, the 14th, one of the shortest par fours on the course. A hole that plays not much more than a two iron and a wedge. Guilford has really been a star, but Ballesteros has orchestrated the whole show as far as that first match is concerned. Probably doesn't look too good to you at home, but who knows? Uh, Faldo and Montgomery can get something out of it. And this match here. Langer's putt at the eighth. 
and straight in while he clattered the flag with his chip and managed to get up and down so smiles from Bernhard Langer Gilbert and Ballesteros five to play that's the same situation through eight it was a half for Bernhard Langer against Pavin and Mickelson so three up and ten to play the United States side Capels in love into the last third of their round three up and six to play against Faldo and Monte but Guilford and Ballesteros will surely even things up at 3-3 in a very short space of time we'll be back with you from Brad Faxon at the 14th just slipping by David Guilford you saw over on the left side of the green Peter Jacobson just off the back edge and you see the ball there of Sevi Ballesteros of course that Peter Jacobson knows this he was 8th in the US Open back in 1989 that one won by Curtis Strange Ian Woosnam in 2nd place who's yet to play here oh. <coughs> slips by the right so no joy for the Americans there Stannis with that left he's got a bit of thinking to do so we'll go to the 13th the second of Nick Faldo well, Nick's out with a one iron just going to try and get himself up in the left half of the fairway here and get himself good access to the pin down, down, down. asking it to get down and it took quite a firm bounce but I think it stayed in the shortish rough and that won't be too bad from there that's a shorter third shot from the right hand side and back at 14 Ballesteros has just about finished stalking his little chip shot and of course if he was to pop that in then there'd be four up and four to play as he's got a free one Guilford we saw was coming back from the break get his four anyway well three up four to play nearly as good back to Fred Couples big drive Ooh, and, well just all right foot left and he might have been struggling to get on the green in three maybe interfered with by that overhanging tree there it creeps into play if you put your second shot too far to the left and too far up the fairway so Couples may be far enough back to get over it it's not such a long shot from there. Three-quarter nine or a wedge. But back on the 15th tee, which is immediately behind the 14th. Ballesteros once again going to play first. Ken, it's a tremendous performance. You know, we've seen Seve Ballesteros off virtually every fairway, but he's kept things going. And I think more importantly than anything else, he's kept David Guilford going. It's... Yes, Ewan, it's been absolutely fantastic to watch them working together. Seve, once it gets to these Ryder Cup matches, becomes even more wonderful than he normally is. In the years that I played it, it was like having two men in your side. Well, he's not playing very well this week, but he's managing to, as always, put up such a wonderful effort. 186 yards, going with a five iron. Looks to be long and left. I think Ballesteros trying to cut that one, and then when he gets the club face shut and swings a little from out to in, and if he squares the blade up to that line, it's going to be a pull. And pulls always go longer than pushes because the club face is stronger. A few 
few more words of encouragement from Sally to David Guilford. I'm OK, David. Ken, same clip for David Guilford, a five iron, maybe just moving it in from left to right. That's exactly what he'd be looking for towards, hitting it to the left centre of the green and just letting it drift. The wind is coming off the left and the cut spin. That's a natural shot for David Guilford with his arms. He draws the woods and moves his arm shots from left to right. And an ideal line for him because the pin's over on the right. Beautiful shot. And it seems almost sort of the worse a shot Seve plays, the better the one Guildford plays. He has to take over and more pressure. He's doing very, very well. Well, certainly Bernard Gallagher will only have to pick three twosomes for the afternoon four balls tomorrow. But what's he going to do when Seve says, I'm now, you see, I can win points. I want to play in the foursomes. <laughs> Well, I would believe him, to be honest. I think it's been a tremendous performance from Seve Ballesteros. Of course, he's seen how the other matches have gone. That puts a little more pressure on you. In the middle of the camera lens there, just a little bit of condensation after the earlier rain. One just beginning to tug at the wind sheet of you know, Davis Love. Yes, the breeze gradually increasing as the day's gone on. Davis with 207 yards to go off a slight upslope. <coughs> well, that's uh, pin high. It's a little bit just about where Rocker was in three. And we know it's a huge swing from left to right. It's a very difficult putt from there. The ideal place is about where Maggot went to, which is short on line. Brad Faxon has already missed the green, now Jacobson. Pressure on him and he likes to cut the ball in, so he'll be playing for the wide part of the green. And same as Savvy Ballesteros, not quite as far through the green, but David Guilford certainly in good shape there. Montgomery's third shot, it's over in the gallery. And, well, it's come out, but I think he's got maybe no stance at all because he'll have to be in the bunker on a down slope and that's very un Montgomery like said in practice he's been so straight and suddenly wafts one away he's at a couple of wayward ones this afternoon did the job on the last green Montgomery so now up to Faldo and pushed his second shot a fraction now let's take a look at the swing of Ballesteros off that 15th tee. You can see that the bottom half of the body is slightly open, so he's got a, th a thought in his mind of moving it from left to right. You see the club there is incomplete. It's pointing to the left. Now what he's done is he's swung the club down on that line, which is a little bit from the outside back into the inside and the way down. If you square the blade to that line, then of course the ball is going to go left. But at least Ballesteros is out there trying to hit one type of shot in the practice rounds. He really didn't know where it was going. And in the back of his mind, throughout today, he's trying to fade the ball off the tee and with his arms. Can't help thinking if he drew the ball back in the stance a little, he would create so much room to swing in to the backswing that he'd be able to draw the ball from the right. But he doesn't like to see that. 170, 135 yards of the seven iron for Nick. And a marvellous stroke because he couldn't see certainly the bottom of the pin and now he's got a putt and if he can hold that he will sort of, I wouldn't say he'll get by a steerous like but you feel that he's, there's one more chance and if he could win this hole there might be just enough adrenaline left to carry them through and maybe make a match of this as yet. We were saying this morning as... Uh, as Rocker and Torrance were losing a hole or two, how a couple that go the other way after having had a big lead, it can prey on the mind a little bit. Back at the 15th, 
and Brad Faxon off towards the bunker there. What's the situation with Biasteros and Faxon, Ken? First one, looking to Faxon, he's going to be the first player to play. His ball's sitting not too badly, actually. He's got plenty of green to work with, so he's got half a chance of getting the ball reasonably near. Seve's ball's nestled down, and so has Peter Jacobson. This pin cut on a little ridge, a little rise, not dissimilar to the one on the six, so almost wherever you hit it, it's liable to run off coming from this angle. And if you hit it slightly too hard, you're definitely going to run into the fringe on the other side. So Guilford really very much in the driving seat here. And there's a close-up of the lie. Just outside our commentary position, this at 15. Nice contact, very nice contact. Too good almost. Hard to believe he could leave it short. He would have had a job doing that in the practice rounds before the rain. Back to 13. And the third shot of couples. And just able to get a shot of it. It's a great angle to come in from. But the difficulty of both his putt and Fowler's is they're downhill and sharply left to right. Galleries around the 15th, the grandstand over on the left, and very pretty place to look down on bunkers green, then a water and a willow tree. Biasteros into the backswing steep, slips the club underneath it, and it's another stunning shot from the Spaniard. Well, I don't know what you're thinking of this at home. You've seen him miss all the fairways, but somehow he has the ability, the belief, the desire, and the will to get his way around the golf course. He'll do anything for Europe in a Ryder Cup, and he's virtually done that all afternoon. Just watch how he goes into the backswing here. Look how steep. Look at the angle between the forearm and the shaft. Club as weak as possible. Nearly hit him in the face on the way up, and it landed, as they say, like a butterfly with trainers on. Wonderful shot from Ballesteros and a certain three. Makes Guilford's putt easier. Does, I think it's been conceded. Now Jacobson. And a very, very good shot of his own account. But to keep this match going, either Jacobson or Faxon have got to pop that in. And even that won't do any good if Guilford holds his. This is Mickelson at the ninth. And that's for a three. And that takes them to four up after nine holes. Another blow for Johansson and Langer. So a putt to win the match, a most unlikely win. Ballesteros on the other side and he's done the work, he's got a three, so he's taken the pressure off David Guilford once again. Full of encouragement, they've gone to work together on it. It's outside the left-hand side of the hole and he's all a good few already, Guilford. Putt at the 13th was absolutely vital. He's got it, has he got it? Yes, he has. And look at the face of Ballesteros. That is an absolutely stunning performance. And Ballesteros, I'd love to know what he's saying to the Americans there. Well, we saw a classic foursomes match this morning with Faldo and Montgomery. Haven and Lehman took them out on the last, but this really has been something to remember. Superb performance from Seve Ballesteros and ably assisted by David Guilford. Yeah, sort of by Ballester, by Ballesteros out of Guildford. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a horse with wings. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> Just look at the face of Ballesteros there. The delight. 
and it's been a while since he's been able to smile like that and nobody knows just how much good this afternoon may well have done for him. 4-3 and three victory for Guilford and Ballesteros over Faxon and Jacobson and that means the score is Europe 3, United States 3. Breathtaking stuff. Montgomery's fifth shot. I saw him coming in that awkward line on the edge of the bunker. Couldn't find the green from there. So just trying to make five and help Nick Falbridge putt. So there, Nick will have a putt from about six feet. Downhill left to right for a birdie four. Freddie Couples next to putt. He's got a putt of about 15 feet on a similar line to Faldo. Davis last putted up to about three feet. So somewhat surprising that Davis isn't holding out and making the five. Do you think they're all a little bit scared of that game ever since the uh, the sixth, Tim? I think so, Bruce, yes. That's one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. The coming and going of four of the best players in the world, three of them three putting, and finally Davis holding from six feet to secure that hole. So now despite we... the Americans being three up, Freddie knows how important this putt is. Seems to me, Tim, looking down the line of this putt, that... Uh, Faldo's marker is almost on his line or presumably he's going to have to putt outside of it to the left. Yes, I think he's going to have to set it off just on the left-hand side of that marker. Hasn't asked for it to be moved which is somewhat surprising. There's so much downhill, it's just a question really of setting it off on line and letting gravity take it down to the hole. Yes, that marker's nowhere near in line because of the speed of it. And if you watch just how softly Couples hits this. and yet how far is that right was a good two and a half feet so it shows you how difficult the putt of Faldo is going to be yes and in a funny sort of way the awkwardness of Faldo's putt is the fact that neither Love nor Couples are dead and whilst these greens aren't as slick as and quick as some they're not the best holders out in the world either of them but Feldham's put all that from his mind, the fact that they might both miss. He's got to assume they're going to hold. He's got to think that they're going to hold. And he really wants to knock this one firmly in the hole. He's got to be a bit careful. It's very quick, as we were saying. And dead weight, he's, he's well, at least six inches left of the hole. Cutting round the rim of a saucer, or even probably the edge of the cup on the top of it. And I think uh, for to turn this round, that had to go in. If I was again, I think if I was coupled here, and I probably might have got Davis Love to putt first on this little one. Both difficult putts, I guess, Bruce. One downhill, right to left, very quick and. Even though this one's across the slope, it still has a fair amount of turn on it. But you might be right. Well now, the only thing really in Davis Love's favour in this putt, is it doesn't matter hitting it hard because if he misses it, that's the end. But he has missed more very short putts in major championships this year, I can remember in the US Open. Yep. Yes. And he was able to knock it confidently in, but he didn't enjoy having to do it. But you're what so a great chance Faldo had. Yes, you're so right. Bruce, they really needed to win that and two down and five to go wouldn't have been so bad. Six and five, Sam Torrance and Costantino Rocca lost. Fred Couples and Davis Love three up and five to play and with that birdie from Phil Mickelson at nine, 
he and Corey Pavin are four up on Langer and Johansson. But it's been a good day for David Guilford and Savvy Ballesteros. Let's go down and join Savvy. He's with Ken Brown. What is it about the Ryder Cup series that brings the best out of you? Well, I, I didn't do very much uh, this afternoon. I think uh, David played fantastic. And uh, as I told him on the first day, I say, hey, you know, uh, I just want to let you know that uh, all you have to do is just go out there, pick up your pace and concentrate on your own game. And, and I just want to let you know also that you are the best player out here. So, I mean, he proved that. It was great. How did you see the incident on number seven? On number seven? What happened on number seven? When, oh, uh, when he picked up the... Uh, uh, well, you know, this is exactly what happened. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Brad Faxon uh, path for... Uh, I mean, Peter asked Brad Faxon path for uh, for Bogey, and, 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 and Peter was just uh, short in two, and I just didn't understand why. I mean, he was patting for Bogey. And, uh, and what happened is that Peter thought that uh, Faxon, uh, Faxon was patting for par instead of for a Bogey. He was in the hazard, and he, uh, he has a penalty shot, but he didn't uh, tell uh, Peter. And that's why Peter chip and pick up the coin, and, and I couldn't believe it. It's just about the lack of communication between the two players. It's, it's too bad. We, we didn't enjoy winning the whole that way, but, I mean, the rules are the rules. How important was your point this afternoon, do you think? Well, every point is important. And, uh, I mean, still, uh, I have a great belief that maybe uh, Montgomery and Confaldo get uh, get back to uh, all square uh, at least, and, you know, and, uh, you know, it's important. Every point is important out here. Are you going to be playing tomorrow morning in the foursomes? I don't know. I have to ask <laughs> Bernard. <laughs> I think David should play, I think, because David is, I mean, uh, all, all he needs is a, a good driver out there to tell him how to play the shot, <laughs> and he's like a machine. Thanks very much, uh, everybody. Well thank done. You. Thank you.